Hey, it's Craig Syracuse of Walking Faith. I'm sitting down with my friend Kay Cordell. Kay, thank you so much for sitting down with me. I know we've been trying to do this for a while, but I truly appreciate this opportunity. I appreciate you inviting me to speak with you, Craig. Well, thank you. Kay, you know, you and I, uh, I think we met a few, maybe about two, three years ago. It was right before COVID. And we spoke and you, first thing you did was send me two of your books. And I, you've written almost 20, which, so I have them right here, right next to me. and. We started to talk a lot, and then you sent me a script, the feature film script that you wrote, and I read it, and immediately I called you. I said, I have to speak to her again about this story. I couldn't believe what I just read, and I just want to read something to, to the viewers, which you sent me, which I think is so powerful. Every child is important, and I tell my story for the hope of understanding and a national commitment in stopping the violence against children. It's a long journey, but I have willingly committed my life to moving forward so others may know that sexual abuse isn't okay and to expose their perpetrators. Seeking justice is not revenge or retribution, but one of the victory for every survivor who can step forward and speak truth so the world can understand that any and all abuse must stop. It is important for the victim to have a voice. And I want to say, Kay, you are that voice. And I want you to, if you can, just tell us a little bit about your story, your childhood, and what led you to write Redbird Phoenix. I grew up Northwest Arkansas in a home of poverty and was abused by my mother, father, brother, and two uncles. And out of that, the hopelessness of the situation, as I grew older, I left home when I was 18, fled uh, the area. And I come to find out Arkansas is the second highest state for sexual abuse in the nation. And every 68 seconds, someone is being raped. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I thought my situation was unique to me. And when you're being abused, you feel like you're the only person. And as I began to mature, the violence I endured could have either defeated me or motivated me, and I chose to be motivated. You know, if you have lemons, you make lemonade if you want to become a survivor. So I decided early on that as the abuse was daily, that I could be different. And my difference caused the abuse to increase. Mm -hmm. And out of that, desperation drives you or it kills you. And I chose to be driven. And I've been driven most of my life to fight back against sexual abuse. I work one-on-one -on -one with clients. I choose who I help here in Arkansas. And, but I have a choice and it comes down to choosing to escape the abuse or let it destroy you. And uh, the horrendous poverty, you, it was what I lived in and I felt like there was no escape. And that is what is horrifying for children. They see this abused by mothers, dads, brothers, aunt, uncles, our strangers, our neighbors, they don't know where to turn. Mm -hmm. And back when I was a child, we didn't have a telephone. We didn't have television. We lived off the grid. And at four and a half, I had to mother my sister and become her mother because my mother was incompetent and didn't want her. And out of that, by the time I was 12, I had a little brother to take care of. And Love for them bound me to that home until I couldn't take it anymore. At age 12, I was sold to a man for a farm by my dad, and I refused to go. And from 12 to 18, my life was a living nightmare. And I managed to finish high school. I would walk barefoot to school, often without shoes, but I had a determination to survive. Uh, now, when did the abuse start? I know you, you mentioned it. And who was abusing you at home? Or uh, I cannot remember. I, it was just always part of my life from time I could understand. Uh, I was being abused by my mother, dad. And then eventually when my brother got uh, nine years old, he started in turn abusing me, helping my mother abuse me. And it was just a part of life. And I didn't even know it had a name. Uh, there is a nameless crime for me. A child is born innocent, and that innocence, I didn't know what was happening. It was part of what was they call normal. And my dad beat me and my brother every day. And to get favors, my brother helped my mother. They got him a little extra bit of food. 
our little extra attention. And so I, there is so many children, we don't know when the abuse happened. It just was there as we aged and progressed and gained an understanding. We bec it was just there, it existed. And so I existed within that, a bubble of abuse. And you, you were close with your grandparents. I know that was right. They live fairly close. Was there ever a time where you could go to them and, and did, were they aware of the abuse or what was taking place within the household? They knew I was being beaten and starved. I don't know where they ever knew about the sexual abuse or not, but they defended me and left when I was in the fourth grade. My dad beat them so violently and uh, grandpa told me, he said, I'll have to leave or I'll have to kill him. And so he made him buy his farm and he left, he and grandma moved. And so I was left then uh, in the fourth grade when they moved, I had no one there to help me. And it was something, I didn't even have a name for it, Craig. I didn't know to say somebody was hurting me. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't even know to tell teachers. They could see I was beaten, come to school all bloody on my legs and arms, but no one, not a person offered to help. And you were also involved in the church, too. I remember, the, I think it was in the script or in the book, you talk about how your dad had, was, had sort of a, an influence, I guess, within the church. Nobody at church, nobody in the community, the sheriff, nobody sort of stepped up and asked you or, or sort of intervened. I had one teacher who went to my dad and wanted me to, she offered to adopt me. He said, you have to buy her. And it shocked her so bad, I never heard any more. She... Uh, it scared her. He was a violent man. Everybody was afraid of him. Even the sheriff was afraid. And the sheriff was not a nice man. And in Madison County, Arkansas at that time, no one named abuse. I had girls in my seventh grade class. One got pregnant. She was forced to quit school. And that was the last any of us ever knew about it. We didn't know what it was or why she all of a sudden was pregnant. And in, at that time, no one, there was absolutely no one who stepped up and tried to help. I had one teacher, Hazel McCullough, after I got up in high school, she started bringing me medicine to put on all the, the beat, where I'd been beaten and my flesh was torn. She had washed me, uh, washed me with a washcloth and alcohol and helped me clean my sores. And she didn't know what to do. She was a distant cousin. She didn't even know what to do to help me. Except what do you bring think? medicine for school? Oh, God. Well, what, well, like, just if you could explain maybe a, a sort of a day in the life, like for instance, when you were on the farm, were there excessive chores? What did you have to do around the house? I know you said you were starved, and, uh, and obviously I got up every every morning. I had to get up at three thirty, go drive in a herd of about fifty cows, milk cows, into the uh, dairy barn, and I had our. First, we started just milking them right on the ground with a pan of feed. You sat down and milked them right on the ground uh, into a bucket. And I had, time I got the milking done, I had to hurry to the house, build a fire in the wood cook stove, and cook breakfast for everybody. And uh, my dad and mother lay in the bed asleep. Then I had to get my baby sister up when she arrived and started to school. I had to get her up, feed her. They got up and ate. And then... Before that, I had to run and feed about 100 head of pigs, sows and pigs, and catch the bus and the dirty clothes I had on from feeding and get my sister on the bus with me to go to school. Oh and by the time the eighth grade, uh, when my dad sold me, I refused to marry the guy. He refused to let me pay for my lunch anymore at school. And for about a week and a half or so there, I would go and look in the lunchroom, stand there starving, and crying and see my little sister and brother eat lunch. He paid for their lunch, but he refused to pay for mine. And the lunch ladies saw me and came and confronted me. And I started crying and I told them I was hungry. And when they found out that my dad wouldn't pay for my lunch, they went to the school principal and demanded I get to work. And so I started earning two meals a day during the school year till I graduated. And those lunch ladies, uh, they saved my life. They were a huge influence on blessing me. One was a neighbor. Uh, they, none of them reported it to the law. 
And did, he, did your father also abuse your your younger sister, or was it just? I mean, or when he was abusing you, or your mom was abusing you, your brother? Did they ever say why? Do you re, do you recall anything? Was there a yes. reason why? My dad did not want me. Uh, he said I wasn't his. He did not claim any of our children, any of us, as his children. And he hated me because he had to attend my birth. And my mother hated him because it hurt her to have me. She hated me from that moment on. I became their scapegoat. Anything that happened from as young as I can remember, I was the, at fault. They would name me as causing the problem in their marriage, in my brother, in the relationship with neighbors. It was always my fault. And I was born cross-eyed, had a cross eye. And they called me the devil child. And I couldn't walk without being led. Uh, I'd just stagger and fall even doing the chores. And uh, it was... It was a situation I didn't even know. We had no car, no way, you know, for people to come and go. We walked everywhere. And uh, it was 25 miles into Huntsville, the city, uh, the uh, county seat. And we'd walk into there maybe every six months and get groceries. Mm -hmm. Or my dad would go and catch a ride. And we bought just like flour, meal, sugar, bacon powders, and baking soda. And that's basically what we had bought at the store and the rest he raised or we did without. He would hunt, but my dad, the only thing I can give him, he did try half haphazardly to feed us. Wow. And, and you know, when I was reading the, the story, the first thing it's like, you know, like most people say, well, why didn't you escape or why didn't you leave? Or was he really a violent man? And you witnessed, which I, I could, I can't believe, you know, I can't process, I, I should say, because I do believe it, that he murdered, was it, I don't know if it was one or two people. The one person, I call him the hat man in the story, or the funny hat man, he came and was just there watching. He'd hide in a persimmon grove on a rock wall and watch our house. My dad evidently had done something that caught the attention of law officials from out of state. And this guy for weeks seemed like he was uh, watching my dad. And he approached me and my baby sister. She was about two years old. And uh, he told me, he said, I'm not going to hurt you girls. I'm here watching your dad. And he would bring pawpaws and feed us. And he told me to tell my dad, he said, tell him I know what he has done. And then all of a sudden, my dad started talking about a red and white spotted dog had, was emptying the milk cans. We had a dairy and milked and sold the milk to a public dairy. And this guy, he started saying this dog was pouring the milk out. And then one night, it was dark rainy night, he comes in head to toe covered in blood and insists that my mother get out of bed and they stripped his clothes. They were newer clothes. We didn't get new clothes, but he burnt everything he had on, put it in the wood stove, fire heater and burn it. And he threatened to kill my baby sister. I woke up and he threatened to kill her if I ever told what I'd saw. And that man never showed up again. And I found the grave, uh, what I thought was a grave when I was in the fourth grade. And uh, it's never been investigated. Nobody ever cared that, you know, and my brothers, they insisted they saw him hauling dead bodies to a cave up on, along the bluff of the farm. And uh, I've tried to get it investigated. It's haunted me. Those, the images of what he was and how he was, he beat us every day, whether we did it or not. He would beat us in some fashion every day. And he, he bought us high top shoes and he never stopped till those shoe tops were filled with blood running over. And that was a daily happening. And it was always under our clothes so that people didn't see. It was what was, we know now as a silent batterer. So, I mean, you've come so far. I mean, witnessed mur multiple murders on your property, were abused every day, starved, sexually abused. How did you overcome, it's beyond adversity, these challenges. I mean, most people would have maybe even questioned going on with their lives. How did I you was, overcome this? I was suicidal more than I could ever name. But at 11 years old, he would go sporadically uh, appear in church. So one night he took us to a revival at Whittier, Arkansas, and it was a lady minister. And 
uh, I accepted Christ that night as my personal savior. And when I accepted God, I got more than I ever understood. And I believe God sent angels unaware to take care of me. I, when I would get scared or dream, a red bird would appear. It was a magical bird. And I know now it was God's way of my small mind of him giving me a symbol of hope. And so because of God, I become who I am today. Wow. And you mentioned, we spoke earlier that when you, I don't know if it was that revival, but somebody spoke spoke into your life. The Holy Spirit gave you that ability to, to overcome or to prepare you for where you are now. Can you yes. tell us about that story? I was 16 years old and was in another revival at Witter, Arkansas. And I'm in Aurora, excuse me, at Aurora, Arkansas at night. And it was a rainy night. And the preacher was up doing his Pentecostal ministry. And all of a sudden, during this service, right in the middle of the sermon, a, the door opened into the church. It was pouring rain. And this strange man, he had white hair. He had a white long sleeve shirt on and black pants. He comes in. And he tells the minister. He holds up his hand. He said, I want you to stop this service now. God has sent me to speak. And he calls me by name. <laughs> I was terrified. And he starts talking to me, makes me get out in the aisle in front of him. He's pointing his bony finger at me. And I'm going, whoa, what is this happening? And I knew my parents would beat me to death because you didn't, you didn't get up and let people see you. You weren't supposed to be looked at. And this guy starts talking to me and he tells me that God has called me for a reason. He said, when you get old, people are going to know your name around the world. And I'm thinking, and you and what else, fool? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh my. And he points to my dad and mother and he tells them, he said, God knows what you're doing to this girl and has known all along. And you are on God's, God's watching you and you're going to pay for what you're doing to your children. And he took me with a hand and prayed for me, laid his hand on me and prayed for me, Craig, and told, and he prayed such a prayer. I felt like I was in the very presence of God. And here was this strange man who thought I had value. It was the first time I ever recognized I had value in God's eyes. And it was, that I think was the beginning of a freeing thought. Mm -hmm. If God saw me, I could do anything. Wow. What happened that day when you went home? I got a beating. I was chastised from head to toe. And my, when I accepted Christ at age 11, my dad took me outside of the service that night and beat me half to death trying to make me recant God. And so from 12 to 18, almost daily, he'd whoop me and say, you're going to deny God. And when I was 16, God called me into the ministry and I knew, and he beat me, he said, no woman in my house will ever be a preacher. Mm. And his mother, my grandmother, Lily was a minister and my grandpa. And I told him, I said, you'll have to kill me because I will not deny Christ. And he took a handsaw later. I was, and I was on the bed. He shoved me on the bed and he started beating me with that handsaw with the teeth. And it was cutting into my body so bad. It hit me over the head real hard with the handle of it. I saw stars. And I thought, well, God, this is it. Now I'm coming home because he's going to kill me. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit came into me, and I saw the red bird behind my dad's head. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, you tell him, he cannot hurt you in the name of Jesus. And I thought, uh-oh, I'm dead, woman. And he raised his hand again with that hand saw and was going to bring it down on me, and he couldn't hit me. Mm. He kept yelling, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you. And I looked straight down, and I said, you can't hurt me, because Jesus is going to stop you. And he finally just tried and tried to give out and he ran out of the room. And from that moment on, there was a factor of fear in what he would do because he knew God had his hand on me. Mm -hmm. But I was punished until I was 18. It was so unbearable. When I got legal age, I fled. I won a scholarship to draw a business school in Little Rock. And so I got a neighbor who was brave enough and he come and got me and took me to the bus station at Fayetteville. And that's how I escaped. God's strength was in me. It never has left. I, I found no place, Greg, to ever say, Lord, I can't do this anymore. So since 18 or since uh, at what age did you decide to come out and speak openly about the abuse and, and to try to, I mean, you've been counseling 
so many people through your books, through your ministry, through visiting, whether it's prisons or, or different organizations. When did you start to just open up about your experience? I was 37 years old when I decided to write a book. And uh, it took me a long time to work without fear. And a few years ago, I gained enough strength. But even with that, Craig, when I started writing my book, uh, Redbird Phoenix, I just knew my mother and dad were outside the corner of the house watching me, going to come in and get me. And the fear factor <laughs> was absolutely horrifying. But the more I wrote the book and rewrote it and perfected it, the more strength I gathered as a survivor. And I'm very thankful today that I am a survivor and I do speak loudly for the clients I choose to work with. I do consulting work, I go with them to court, and I prep them for court. The lawyer usually doesn't even have to prep them, I do all that free for each uh, client I work with. And help them get their children out of abuse, help them escape, and I try to give them the strength I've gained through years of fear. Uh, the fear factor is absolutely, the worst thing is a, a, a child who's being abused, the fear, it's all, in, uh, it's all encompassing. It's, you're compassed about by this atmosphere of acceptance that abuse is normal. And a child in that, they have no one. The monster lives with them daily in the closet or under their bed. The monster is real. It slips in at night. Uh, when the light's off, the hand goes up to the, you know, privates of a child and the hand goes over the mouth, threats are made. I'm going to kill you if you tell. I will kill your baby sister. I'll kill your mother. And uh, so 47% uh, of abuse is done by someone in the home or someone you know. I think it's like 47% of abuse uh, that happens in the home. Did you know that in general public in the United States, there's four 133,648 Americans, 12 and older, who are sexually assaulted uh, are raped every year here in America. And it's just, it's unacceptable. I'm telling my story, Craig, so that others can know, a victim can know it's all right to tell. Tell loudly, tell it at school, tell it to your friends, tell it to your counselor, tell it to your preacher. Go to the grocery store, find someone wearing a Walmart vest and tell them I am being abused. I need help. Someone is hurting me sexually. I need help. And some today people are educated and they'll call the police for you. But did you know uh, out of every hundred cases, only one out of a hundred is ever a victim ever tells. That's one out of a hundred victim ever tells they're being abused. And out of that hundred, only one out of 10 perpetrators are ever arrested. Wow. So it's a national epidemic. Wow. So what, why is it like, why do people feel the need or why don't they feel the need to tell? Is it uh, embarrassment? Is it, is it the fear of, of the perpetrator retaliating? What is, what is it? What is it? It's, it's all of those fear. And if a child, uh, if you are a child, you have the fear of losing your family, of losing uh, your mother, your dad, what is troubling is the child loves, if it's a parent or a brother, you love that perpetrator. There's an innate uh, need when we're born to be loved. And we are supposed to love our parents. We're taught that in Sunday school. We're taught that in church. Are you in school? And when you're being hurt, you're torn. There's such a mental bondage of telling. And it, it's crippling absolutely destroys that ability and it make when that uh mental barrier is breached by sexual abuse you're you're open to yourself the rest of your life as a victim to other perpetrators and you can go through counseling i went through 20 years of counseling making sure that i fixed me and that i had i left no stone unturned it was no secret i didn't examine to make sure i was free of the abuse but that freedom comes at a high cost, you lose your family. I lost all of my family. And when I came out with my books, I had several cousins within the Russell family and the Walker family come and tell me we were abused by uncle so-and-so or by our brother or by our dad. And 
they had never been able to tell it until I came out of the closet. And we need the closets of homes opened up so children feel safe. Mm. Yeah. I agree. It's like you said, we said too before about sharing your testimony, sharing your story. You know, I just interviewed someone the other day, very well-known woman who spoke about how she was abused for years and she thought it was her fault. And then when she shared her story, she realized that her daughter and her sister were also being abused by the same man. And I've interviewed people where they were being abused by superiors, let's call them. And then to find out that when they went for counseling, the counselor would also abuse them. Yeah. And you hear it now, and I see the effects of it 30, 40 years later, and I could, I, I could see the effects on them, their visual effects. And I always wonder that, you know, is there something about the person? First of all, I think people are drawn to organizations or, or places where they have access to kids. I think that's part of it, that they look for opportunities. But also, is there something that they sense, the vulnerability? We, you know, do they groom specific people? Do they look for targets where they could actually abuse them? How does that take place? I think I, I worked with one counselor, and I have to agree with her. She said she thought victims uh, excreted a pheromone that uh, perpetrators recognize. I believe it's in our demeanor. I was real shy. I couldn't look anybody in the mm -hmm. eye, and I was always fearful. I would hang back. I couldn't speak. Uh, to anyone hard. I could, if I gave a book report in school, I would wet my pants, Craig. <laughs> it, was, it was horrifying to be in the public eye. And I realized how far God has brought me today. I can speak to thousands and it doesn't bother me. My testimony is to tell people there's freedom in your voice. Your voice is your opportunity of freedom. And once that voice tells, like I've done in the uh, Redbird Phoenix book and in the script I've written, we need to recognize as believers in Christ, as good citizens, that there's children, there's women who are being raped and abused who doesn't, who doesn't have a voice. I want to be that voice for every victim in this country and say, look, you may be five years old, you may be six, seven, eight, go to your teacher and tell what is happening to you. I want my script uh, developed and out there for the fact it is a story of freedom. Mm -hmm. It is a story of violence, but it's a, it's a wonderful story based on the book. And I believe it'll give people, it'll open windows and doors and it'll give a seat for the victim to sit in and tell her story or his story. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. I, I, like I said, I read the script. I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe the story. And there's so much to your story that obviously we can't go over now. I want people to buy the books. Just one quick question as it comes to me, because something that, like I said, when we worked on these stories, what are some of the things that let's say someone isn't being abused, but they're being groomed, which leads to, which can lead to abuse. What are some of the things that kids or adults could look out for that, 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 that maybe they could sit or parents could look at and say, is this person grooming my son or daughter? What are some of the things that we can look for? Uh, a groomer wants time alone with your child. They want that child fearful. They want that child to feel like no one cares. And that's what a perpetrator looks for, is the child who's needy, who clings to them, who wants hugs. And they will, a coach, a teacher, a pastor, uh, another parent or an uncle, you know, family, they will spend time alone. I had one uh, client who was her grandpa raped her and he would take her driving, mm. take her alone driving day after day, year after year, found out finally and went to court with some of them. He had, he had raped and molested 34 members of the family. Incest is one of the worst problems in this country, especially here in Arkansas. Uh, and this is something that if you see your child and they become to wet the bed, Mm. Are their panties are stained? Are their underwear, a boy's underwear? Are they pay a lot of attention to their privates? Are they masturbate? These are things that teachers, parents, uh, pastors, Sunday school teachers, they need to be aware of. And I believe every church worker, as a, we as teachers, I was a teacher, I had to have my background, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a criminal report done. And I taught in a prison, Craig, and I talked to so many sex offenders in my classes, and they, they often turn around and become abusers. This is a problem we've got to stop now in our society mm -hmm. and educate. No victim 
is at fault. The biggest thing that uh, perpetrators win with is they make it the victim's fault. We've got too many pastors, too many church overseers who blame the victim and make them the uh, one that's at fault. And we've got to remove that variant, that fault, out of the equation of victimization. Believe your child. Too many mothers will let mar shack up with someone or uh, live, you know, marry someone, uh, a stranger to the child, and that child will come to them and say, you know, uh, stepfather is hurting me at night. And they, they blame the victim. I don't know how many teenagers I've worked with who was kicked out of the home because the mother would not believe that, you know, her husband was raping her own children. Mm. And that's, uh, that's why I want this, I want the stigma uh, taken away out of victimization. Mm. And there's no question that can be asked of me that I won't try to answer. I want the shame. Shame has got to be removed. The victim has committed no sin. They've committed no crime. They are taken advantage of. And I want to take, I want to take the perpetrator and let people see him. I want him to be unmasked in public. And a victim needs to name their perpetrators publicly, write their name, give it to their teacher, give it to the pastor. Now a pastor is mandated nationwide. They have to report abuse in 24 hours. And that's excellent. We're getting to a point. But as I've told you, I want to fight until we get a congressional amendment for victims uh, added to the Constitution. And that's my goal. I'm praying that I live long enough to accomplish that. I hope to see that. I really do. It, it's, there's so many questions. I know there's going to be parents out there. Like I said, we've done work um, and just learning about the grooming process. Um, and, and I'm glad that you were able to touch on that. If people want to get involved, get in contact, I, I love your website. I, I told you that before. You have a fantastic website with so much information that tells the story. And I'll tell you, my goal is beyond the film to help you on the film is, is to visit the ranch. And I know, I don't know if your family still has access to it or owns it, but I do want to go there at some point. I pray that we're able to do that and look for just, just to go there and just to see what we could uncover. Because I know, like you said, some of those bodies are still buried at the ranch. Um, so it's something, and I think you said that it was destroyed with dynamite, but there is still evidence there. I want your story to be told, you know, to, to everyone that'll listen because it is powerful. Well, that's the reason I wrote the book. When Forgiveness is Enough, the counseling consulting book. There's information in there for everyone that wants to be involved, what to look for, the signs of abuse, uh, how a child will act, how, who to get in touch with, what to take if you've got to flee a domestic violence. We're dealing with narcissism today in violence that the country has never recognized. We need education on sexual abuse and domestic violence. And I too, I want, before I die, if it's possible, Craig, to examine my father's farm. I know where I believe the, the funny hat man's body was. I know there was an area that we were forbidden to go into. I know it's been told to me that he was suspected of kidnapping two girls and killing them and burying them on that farm. Mm -hmm. And my brothers believe that he took bodies up to a cave on our farm. I just, if it's there, I either want my, what I saw exposed or determined that maybe it was just, you know, a childish idea that he lied. He was, uh, he was in the church and uh, he was violent. People were scared of him. They wouldn't even sit him down in church. He'd just get up and uh, run and rant all over the church and the pastor was scared of him. He'd do that every morning, Sunday, we'd go to church. He was mad and angry. And they'd get in church, my mother and him, and fight and testifying against each other of all things in the church. <laughs> oh my God. It was hysterical. Well, like I said, I, I, I do at some point want to go back. It reminds me of a story. It's funny, you know, when I do these interviews, all these interviews come back, and there was a woman who was abused by her father, and he passed, and she went back to the house years later, and she found all these tapes, and she played the tapes, and it was her being molested and abused by her dad. And she f completely forgot about it for 30, 40 years, wherever it was, she blocked it out. And when she went back to the house, she saw those tapes and she told me the story and I just couldn't believe it. She was an older gal and I couldn't believe that, you know, what we're able to sort of 
bury and forget about, so to speak. So going back to the ranch is just something I, I really do hope that we're able to do at some point. So, so for people that want to get involved, I don't know if you do social media, TikTok, or what you do, but can you tell us your website, where we can find your book so people can reach out to you and, and get to know Kay and hopefully support the film that you're putting together? I'm techno technologically. <laughs> uh, no, it's fine. So I, I'll tell people, listen, you can always reach me, contact me. I can introduce you to Kay. We're friends. Or you can find Kay Cordell on Facebook because she's, yes. she's always active on Facebook. But I, I do really do want people to to get involved and purchase the book, read the book, and and and, and they're on the books are on Amazon under C A E Cordell, and my email is all lowercase C A E two three four at msn dot com, and my phone number is available, and I'm willing to talk work. I have a script already developed, and it is. It's really amazing how that uh, I've had different folks help me with it, and it is a wonderful script. And I look forward to someone working with me and developing that script. And mm -hmm. my books, as I said, are on Amazon. And the counseling book is wonderful. It's used in court by different law firms, and it helps lawyers win their cases. And I give it to the victims. I let them use it free. There's, I don't charge for what God's in. Uh, inspired me to write. It's there for the public. Now the books are up, you know, for sale, as I said on Amazon. But if a law firm wants to use the book, I'll sign a release for them to use it free. Wow. Okay. Thank you so much. It's been a, it's been a pleasure. I really appreciate. It. Sorry, I know it, you know your schedule, my schedule. It took a little bit of time, but I'm really I'm happy. I'm grateful that we got the opportunity to speak. And and I advise people to reach out to Kate. Reach out to me. I, I'm more than happy to make the introduction. Always remember, guys, you have the ability to inspire and evangelize your words and actions. And, and Kay, God bless you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, dear. I appreciate it.